This is in the uh, genealogies from Matthew and Luke. And I don't want to imply that it's a waste of time to look into these things, because it's not. But I am going to say this. Satan loves it when we get hung up on some study that captivates us and keeps us from praying for revival, keeps us from soul winning, keeps us from uh, sharing our faith in Christ with those around us, keeps us from uh, thinking on things that, that uh, we need to be doing that are pleasing to the Lord, and we just are hung up on some Greek word or Hebrew word, etc. cetera. And, uh, and I think Satan is pleased with that because it keeps us out of the fight. And so beginning in verse number 8 of, of Luke chapter number 2, <coughs> the Bible says that we're in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. The glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill. Toward men. The, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Bless the reading of your word. Speak to our hearts. Challenge us. Help us to retain the sacredness of the birth of Christ in our hearts and minds. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The word here for good tidings in verse number 10. I bring you Good tidings. That's actually um, a word that uh, is often translated gospel, the good news. We, we know the word gospel means the good news. It's not the exact same word found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but it is a, a slight variation of it. Uh, in other words, if you... Look up words that you're going to find in the Strong's Concordance, for instance, it's only one word off. It's just a variation like you would say, you know, this word is like present tense or past tense of, of a word. But it's really the same word. And that's what you find when the Bible says, I bring you good tidings. Um, he's, saying, uh, he's saying, I'm bringing you the gospel, the good news. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, uh, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The word for good tidings found in our text in Luke chapter 2, it, it, it's found, the Greek word occurs 90 times in the King James um, uh, text. It's translated Gospel 24 times, preach or preached uh, 47 times. And every, every time the word gospel is found in the New Testament, which is 104 times you find the word gospel, it's some form of the same root word. So every time you find the word gospel, be assured of this, it is talking about the good news. The, the only difference in these two passages, and then I'm going to just move on, the only difference is uh, that in Luke chapter number 2, it is the proclaiming of the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it is the gospel message. In other words, the truth of the gospel compared to the proclaiming of the gospel. But it is the same gospel. 
It is the same message. And Jesus Christ came and the angels bore witness and made the proclamation, I give you good tidings, I give you the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is important for us to know, to, re to remember. I really, what I want to speak about tonight, having laid that backdrop, is I want to speak about the secularization of Christ's birth. The secularization of Christ's birth. Now, you probably think you know what I'm talking about when I say that, but I'm going to distinguish it uh, as different than probably the direction that your mind is going. I am not trying to talk tonight about commercializing Christ's birth. Commercializing Christ's birth is what we usually rant against, and rightly so. Uh, commercializing the birth of Christ uh, has to do with, you know, uh, roadside stands full of Christmas trees. By the way, if you're looking for a bargain, you can get those really cheap right now. I saw a bunch of them at Menard still uh, some that people had bought. I bet you could get those on a song, right? If you just uh, move your, your, you know, you'd, make, you'd save a lot of money if you just started celebrating Christ's birth, you know, a week after. But anyway, you save a lot of money. Uh, wreaths are on sale right now, too. But uh, Christmas gifts, uh, uh, mall Santa Claus, and, and all these things, the commercialization of the birth of Christ is usually what we are lathered up about and not wrong to do that, by the way. But that's different than secularizing the birth of Christ. Secularizing the birth of Christ, what I mean by that is to take the birth of Christ and try to adopt it in such a way into our culture as to promote the, 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 um, the new woke mentality to make it fit in to and it's it's happening all around us i think um i think it's one of the dangers of uh hollywood or whether it's hollywood or anybody else uh depicting the life of jesus when they take so much license with it I'm not sure how far to go with that. Um, in other words, things like uh, Sight and Sound, I've been to many of their productions, uh, enjoy them, They're, they do a fantastic job, but there is a negative to them. And that negative is that I think sometimes people begin letting things like that be a substitute for the Bible. In other words, we're just going to watch a production. Well, the problem is that those productions are not necessarily scriptural. Uh, there was something on just recently this last week concerning the life of Christ, and it just it always irritates me, and I just have to say something about it. I don't, I don't want to. I understand that they're, just, they're, just, they're taking license with it. But I don't want to take license with the gospel. I don't want to take license with the word of God. But almost without exception in any depiction of the life of Christ, you look around and he's the only one with long hair. All the apostles, they don't have long hair. Just Jesus has long hair. And it just irritates me. Okay? You say, well, it's not that big a deal. Okay. Except for the fact that people start accepting this facsimile as the real they start getting you know i i sometimes talk about we ought too often get our our doctrine from a song instead of from the word of god and i think that there's a a corollary to this where people are getting their doctrine from productions and therein lies a danger there are those who argue well it it exposes the world, it exposes non-Christians to the word of God. 
Well, that may be. But in what form? In other words, if it exposes them to a false gospel, is it really helping? Or is it doing harm? In uh, doing a lot of reading over the past couple of weeks, coming up on this time of year, news stories or, or, ma- or articles pop up, etc. cetera. And, uh, and I read this one, and it, it falls into this category. And I'm going to read excerpts of this. And the, the, uh, the uh, title of the article is, is what history really tells us about the birth of Jesus. What history really tells us. Well, I was, it caught my attention because the birth, uh, the birth, life, death, resurrection of Christ is one of the most historically documented series of events in the world, in world history. There, there, there is so much documentation concerning these events. And so I read the article and was disappointed. And at first he goes through and he talks about all the things that are just, just you know, you just, how can you even think about that? You know, he starts off with the, the low-hanging fruit and talks about, uh, first he says, uh, the actual birthday of Jesus was not on December 25th. Uh, okay, well, let me just, can I just uh, play devil's advocate a little bit? Everybody that says it was not on December 25th, they don't know when it was. I've never had, you know, I've never read an article where somebody says, no, I know when the real birthday was. And so if you don't know it wasn't, if you don't know when it was, then you don't know it wasn't. And so do you think he was born on December 25th? I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I don't really care. Could he have been? Sure, he could have been. But I don't care. Uh, you know what I care about? He was born. He was born of a virgin. You see, this is what I was talking about like in my introduction about we get hung up on things that really aren't going to matter. What matters is he was born. He was born of a virgin. He was born God in the flesh, the Son of God, so that he can save us from our sins. That's what matters. You say, how do you know? Because if the day exactly mattered, God would have told us when it was. Now, every time I say something like that, like, yeah, some scholar's going to call me on the phone because they saw it on live stream and they're going to send me, they're going to, you know, send a, an, a, an email to the church and, and it's going to have, you know, lunar charts in it. And, uh, and it's gonna have all these things about, you know, he, he's pinpointed the birth of Jesus Christ. Kudos. It don't matter. If it mattered, God would have told us specifically what day it was on. You know what matters? What he did tell us. He was born of a virgin. So this writer goes on to to say in this article, he says, uh, number two, the inn, the the, the inn uh, where there was no room in the inn, well, that really didn't happen. Most likely, he said, don't you like that? When they say this absolutely didn't happen, then they go to say what did, and they say, well, most likely, or it could have been, or it might. In other words, they don't know. Okay, most likely, he says, I'm reading now, most likely Joseph and Mary stayed with family. They went down to Bethlehem and stayed with family. You know, because it's Christmas, right? Well, not until Jesus is born, it's not. But they, they stayed with family. But the guest room was too small for childbirth. How much, let, me, let me ask you this. How much room do you need for childbirth? You, you need room for the mother to lay down, the doctor to be in a position to catch, and room for the baby to come out. That's really what you need, right? That, that's, that about sums it up. Children have been born in the back seat of a car. So to say that the guest room was too small it just, it just, to me, it's laughable. Okay, the guest room was too small for childbirth. And hence, Mary gave birth in the main room of the house where animal mangers could also be found. Yeah, this is where my wife loved 
going to Israel. She hated going with me. <laughs> because I'm the guy when they say, well, this is the Mount of Transfiguration. And right up there is where Jesus, right there. See that little, see that stick? That's where Jesus was standing when he was transfigured and his face shone. And, and, uh, and Moses appeared to, you know, that's, that's, and I'd say, we don't know that. <laughs> well, we don't know that. Well, we don't. This is where Jesus was baptized by John. And George. Well, we don't know that. Really? You sure it wasn't 10 feet up that way or, you know, 15 feet downstream? And so she hated going with me because I am the biggest skeptic in the world. You know what matters? He was baptized. That's what matters. You know what matters? He was transfigured. That's what matters. We don't worship a place. We worship a person. And so, uh, so just get that. And by the way, this falls right in line. We were, we were in, uh, uh, I think it was we were in Bethlehem, and they said, oh, see that cave over there? That's where Jesus was born. Uh, he was really, it doesn't say it in the Bible, he was born in a cave. That's, that's, that was their stable and, uh, and that's where he was born. Well, we don't know that. And so, so now you know, Jesus was, G Joseph and Mary went to stay with family. And, and the guest room was too small for all the NICU equipment, <laughs> evidently. And, uh, and so um, they were born in the, he was born in the main room where they kept the animal stables because that's what people do. Um, now, kudos to you if you have dogs or cats. But to think I'm going to have like, you know, uh, a roosting bar for my chickens in the main room of my house? I think not. Uh, it goes on, and there's stuff about the wise men, and et cetera, et cetera, that, uh, you know, the shepherds, et cetera. Well, you know. Uh, and so he, he basically goes through all this stuff. You get down to the, the summary. Here's, here's where he's heading. He, and he titles this part of it, A Radical Christmas. Okay. So he said, if we pare back the story to its biblical and historical core, don't you love that? <laughs> He's, he's so concerned about being biblical, and yet he won't even acknowledge the virgin birth. When he gets to the virgin birth, he says, as some believe, which calls it into question. So he says, if we pare back the story to its biblical and historical core, removing the stable, the animals, the cherub-like angels, the inn, what are we left with? The, the Jesus of history was a child of Jewish of a Jewish family living under foreign regime. He was born into an extended family living away from home and his family fled from a king who sought to kill him because he posed a political threat. You see what they're doing? They're trying to secularize the account of Jesus' birth to make it sound like the southern border of the United States, for instance. That's what they're doing. You say, oh, that's what they're doing. Okay, let me keep reading. The Jesus story, it's not an account. The Jesus story, in its historical context, is one of human terror and divine mercy, of human abuse and divine love. It is a story that claims God became human in the form of one who is vulnerable, poor, and displaced, in order to unveil the injustice of tyrannical power. That's why Jesus came. Man, I've been wasting my time for 32 years pastoring here trying to say he came to save people from their sin. No, he came to show um, how, to displace, how, how people are displaced they're vulnerable, they're poor, and they're displaced in, uh, because of the injustice of tyrannical power. The only thing this guy doesn't do is, is blame in, uh, climate change on the birth of Christ. You know. 
He goes on to say, while there is nothing wrong with the devotional piety of Christian tradition, a whitewashed nativity scene risks missing the most radical aspects of the Christmas story. Hey, he's going to tell us what's really important. The Jesus described in the Bible had more in common with the children of refugees born on Nauru than the majority of Australian churchgoers. He too was a brown-skinned baby whose Middle Eastern family was displaced due to terror and political turmoil. That's what's important. He, he, just, he just gave you what, you don't want to miss this. You see, the nativity, the nativity scene, if you're not careful, it's going to make you miss that he gets us. My favorite thing to hate in these days is those commercials. He gets us. Because he too was a, his, his mom was, he comes from a single parent home. He gets us. Which by the way, that's not true. But, uh, but he gets us. He was a uh, uh, born under political tyranny. He gets us. He was oppressed. He gets us. Um, and so he was a brown-skinned baby whose Middle Eastern family was displaced due to terror and political turmoil. You know who that is? Hamas, right? I mean, that's, that's the reason for Hamas, because they are oppressed. He ends up with this. But if we nostalgically focus on one baby, who's the one? Jesus. If we nostalgically, oh, it's nostalgia, we focus on one baby while, while prince and power of the air, whilst ignoring the numerous babies who suffer around the world due to politics, religion, and poverty, we miss the entire point of the Christmas story. The entire, to, to him, and to the world today, the entire point of the Christmas story has nothing to do with the sin of man. Has nothing to do with redemption. Has nothing to do with the good news, the gospel. This is what is I call the secularization of the birth of Christ. Not the commercialized. Com it, to me commercializing the birth of Christ is child's play comparing it to secularizing the birth of Christ because these people are meant to be taken seriously you know store owners are just trying to get your money they don't, they don't ask you to be a true believer they're just trying to get some cash out of you <clears throat> and so you got I mean you, so your children you know got to have the latest greatest toys but these people are saying the main purpose of the story of the birth of Christ is so that you and I will will see the millions of children born uh, to uh, brown-skinned people and oppressed politically and religiously around the world If we're not careful, we are going to let the world spoon feed us their gospel of wokeness, their gospel of uh, the the modern the modern Christ through entertainment through. Uh, secularizing the 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 uh, uh, life of Jesus Christ and 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 again I, I'm still not sure where to come down on on all this stuff that it's that it's just I just see a danger in it that if you that the average person that doesn't spend time in the Word of God is going to think that's really the message of the Bible and it is not. 
The Bible has a different way of saying Jesus gets us. It says we have a high priest. We have not a high priest that's not touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So what do we need to understand? We need to understand that Christ died to save us. He did not die as a martyr. He did not die to leave us a good example. He did not die because of unfortunate circumstances. He wasn't, he wasn't just born at the wrong time into the wrong political circumstances and tragically uh, the forces were against him and, uh, and he was mistakenly put to death. No. <clears throat> Jesus said, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. He, nobody took Jesus' life. Jesus gave it willingly. But God, verse uh, 8 of Romans 5, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The angels declared, I bring you good tidings of great joy. There are different, <coughs> there are different uh, messages. There's the message that the angel gave to Mary. There's the mes message the angel gave to Joseph. There's the message the angel, angel gave to the shepherds. There's, there's all these messages. There's the message that God gave to John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. But they all are centered around one thing. Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. Then I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, <coughs> which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, you keep in memory what I preach unto you, lest you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, how that I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, you want to get back to the biblical, historical Jesus. That's who he is. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then that he rose, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So he died, he rose again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ does several things. He, it declares his deity. Romans chapter number one, look there with me. We're going to start heading toward the exit. I don't mean that one. I mean of the sermon. Romans chapter one. And verse number four. The Bible says, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the holy, excuse me, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. He was declared to be the Son of God with power. Declared to be the Son of God with power for by the resurrection of the dead. It, the resurrection declares his deity. The resurrection defines our expectation. It defines our expectation. <clears throat> Back in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 19 through 20, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first fruits. He is risen from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, for as in Adam, all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Verses 42 through 44 of the same passage. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. In verse 51 and 52 of the same passage, Behold, 
I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So it defines our expectation. His resurrection declares, defi- uh, declares his deity, defines our expectation. And then lastly, it describes our destiny. 1 Peter 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has begotten us, brought us into life with a lively hope, a living hope, because Jesus rose from the dead. So the resurrection of Christ describes our destiny. All through the scriptures, I was reading again this afternoon, where the Bible declares that Jesus Christ was from eternity past. He did not begin in Bethlehem's manger. He's always been God the Son. We talked about Sunday. We talked about the three titles given to him in the Gospel of Matthew. The Christ, which is the anointed one. The uh, the name Jesus, which means Savior, and, the, Messiah, and uh, the, the, the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When you put those together, you get the basis for the gospel. God came and was with us to be the Savior of the world as it was prophesied of the Messiah. If you're not careful, you will get hung up I almost don't even want to say this because I'm afraid of triggering someone to go off the rails, to figure this out. If you're not careful, you'll spend all your time trying to figure out why the Bible says the declaration of the angels, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But then Jesus says, Think not that I came to bring peace, but a sword, but division. Now, wait a minute. Oh, there's a discrepancy. If you're not careful, you'll spend all your time trying to figure out things like that instead of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, if, the, if Satan can't keep, if, okay, he wanted to keep you from being saved. But he failed if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if he failed at that, then he cannot undo it. He can't make you somehow be unsaved or lost again. So the next best thing is to keep you from being effective as a Christian. What does effective as a Christian mean? Well, the Bible talks about bearing fruit bringing forth fruit, much fruit, more fruit, fruit that remains. That's what God wants for you. But if you're not careful, all you do is argue about words to no profit, striving about things that do not matter, arguing about things or looking for things that If God wanted you to know, he would have told you. Now, I do not mean to say don't search out the scriptures because we are supposed to search out the scriptures. But we're supposed to search for Jesus Christ in the scriptures. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have uh, eternal life and they are they which testify of me. The message of of the gospel is Jesus Christ He had to be born, as the Bible said, lived a sinless life, died a substitutionary death, 
rose again victorious for you and for me. That's the message. Don't let the world secularize the story of the birth of Christ. Don't let them make it about just one more brown-skinned baby fleeing oppression. Let's open the borders. Let's, let's uh, you know, promote one world, kumbaya, uh, and, and all of those. Listen, that's, that's just secularizing the gospel. Father, I pray that you would help us to not just at this time of year, but all through the year, to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, wise understanding how subtle the arguments of the devil are. Yea, hath God said, the day that you eat thereof, you'll be as gods to know good and evil. God, I pray that we will be wise. Not allow Satan to distract us from the most important thing, that is the preaching, proclaiming of the truth of the gospel. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel. God, I pray that you would help us to give ourselves wholly to it. In Jesus' name, with our heads bowed and rising.